to Online for Authors, where I, Terry M. Brown, author of character-driven fiction and host of the podcast, introduce readers to characters they'd love to invite to lunch by interviewing authors, discussing their books, learning about the writing process, and even, on occasion, chatting live with a panel of authors to discuss topics relevant to both readers and writers. My guest today on the Online for Authors podcast is Elaine Schroeder, author of the book, The Bravest Soldiers. Elaine reads and writes historical fiction to escape writing about computer software and to travel to other places in time. In my book review, I stated that The Bravest Soldiers was an amazing historical fiction with a dash of romance. It is set in World War II in Australia and has been winning awards, as it should. For those who know Elaine's work, we meet Sophie in book one of the immense Sky Saga. She was a nurse in World War I in France, but when the war ended, she emigrated to Australia with her new husband, adopted son, and stepson. The Bravest Soldiers is what happens to Sophie as a mom during World War II. Sophie is one of those do-it-all ladies who sees a need and fills it. But what happens when the needs are those you cannot fill, and the fear of loss is almost too immense? Elaine helps us see that bravery doesn't just happen on the front line of war. In fact, the bravest soldiers are often the women who are left behind to keep things running despite the stress and worry. Sorry. (laughs) That's all right. Welcome to Online for Authors, where today we have Elaine Schroeder, author of The Bravest Soldiers. Welcome, Elaine. Hi, Terry. It's nice to see you. It is awesome for you to be here. I am so excited. I I loved The Bravest Soldiers. But before we get started and go any further, let's do just kind of your quick elevator speech and let everyone know, like, what is this book about? This book is about women getting through war when there's when their men are off fighting and what they go through when when they're at home wondering and worrying what's going on and and where do we have it set it's set in sydney australia which is uh one of my favorite places in the world and um and also Syria, Lebanon, because one of the sons is off fighting there, and New Guinea, because both sons end up in New Guinea. Okay. All right. So this is kind of like a continuation of your first book, Dare Not Tell. Yes, it is. Okay. I'm curious. But they can be read as standalones. Right. right. They can be read as standalones, because I did that. I did not. I I didn't read your first one first. I read this one first. Um, I'm curious. Did you always know when you wrote Dare Not Tell? Were you aware at that time that you were going to write a continuation of that story? Yes. So you planned it. I did not plan it so much as as the characters took over my brain. I I understand. And wouldn't let me stop. (laughs) I I was like, what next? What next? Okay, so I would just keep writing. So you had planned on just the first one. And then as you wrote, you recognized there was a second one with those characters in it. Is there a third? Of course. Uh I'm working on it now. (laughs) How awesome. And it is fighting back a little. Is it? Okay. Okay. Just a little. Just a little. All right. So you kind of alluded to this, but why Australia? Like you say Sydney's your favorite, but you're not from Sydney. No, I'm not no. Australian at all. Yeah. Um, really, it has to do with an Australian television show okay. called Miss Fur- Fisher's Murder Mysteries, um, which I started watching 10 years ago. And um, it's set in 1929, Melbourne. <clears throat> but at the time, I did not know that... Australians were in World War II. I barely even knew that the Americans were in World. Sorry, in yeah. World War One. Yeah, uh, that the Americans were in World War One, and I was a history major, so I should know better. Um, but it just, it just struck my fancy because these characters were so wonderful. But then in one episode, the the male lead says something about automatic Browning machine gun, you know, rifles. And um, that the Americans invented them and they used them during World War One. And I went, 
wait a minute, how do you know about this? Well, because he was using them and because right. he was fighting with Americans. So right. it all right. cascaded from there. And from there, yeah. Isn't it funny how small things will cause us to write a story? Like, yes. Like the smallest, people ask me, well, where do you get your story ideas? And it's like, some of them are pretty awesome. Like my grandfather told me a story and that's what sparked an enemy like me. And it was, you know, like he said something that was pretty like awe inspiring. And mm -hmm. then my third book, Daughters of Green Mountain Gap, it's because I had a wart. Like there's no, <laughs> you know, and it's like people say you had a wart. It's like, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's a whole story, but it's, it's interesting how different things will like get your brain moving i've heard songs oh, yes. before where where like the song is over and now my brain is going i wonder what would have happened if what would have happened if you know and then off you go on a on a story right line. yeah my for me it's photographs because i'm a very visual person mm -hmm. um it's photographs and i saw this I found so I started when I started digging into World War One and what the Australians were doing and what the Americans were doing and I found out that we have this long history of fighting to, in wars together. Um, I found this photograph of a young soldier saluting a toddler. They're both in profile and the tot they're saluting each other and this is cute little toddler boy and he's you know plump and juicy and right little puffy <laughs> pants and this tall slim soldier you know his, his uniform is so new he doesn't even have any of his insignia or his battalion patches on it or anything and they're saluting each other and i saw oh. that photograph and i just went oh my god i love this I don't know who this man is or this child, but it just settled See, immediate, in my brain. Immediately, just, I'm wondering, is this father and son? Is this older brother and younger brother? Right. Like, I have goosebumps running up my arms just from I you too. explaining it. Every time, every time I see that photo, I'm just, oh, my God. I mean, and I saw this photo for the first time maybe eight years ago, but it's still, I have the same, hello, yeah. my dog just wandered in, um, same reaction. Um, and I just knew I fell head over heels in love with the photo and I with the and also with the idea of who this man was. And he became Joe Parker and the little boy became his son, Sam. And it just, you know, you know how it goes. It just, yes. And it, it just and starts blossoms. to morph. It just yes. starts to become this. I don't know. Do you have like my characters literally talk to me like like they're oh, having yes. whole conversations and things and 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 I'm like struggling to keep up and get it all down because they're just they're just going. And yes. so so I'll see something or hear something. I, I think that I'm more auditory. Um, I have very poor vision and I've had it my entire life. And so I think that, that the auditory is what catches me and I'll hear something like a song and. And it's like my mind just starts whirling and then the characters mm -hmm. start to build. And then, yeah, it's like they take over my life. And, and yes. I, I hate it when it happens when I'm already working on a project. And it's like, you guys have got to stop. I have to finish up what I'm doing here. You know, okay, look, I'm writing down what you've said. It's here and it's in a file. Now you have to go away <laughs> until I'm done. Yes. <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. Uh, <laughs> so th my characters, th my main pr male protagonist, of course, is Joe Parker. Well, my dog's name is Joey, and there's no relation between the two. Okay. I had the dog long before I had the okay. character. Okay. <laughs> but I have, I have, you called the dog, but. In my mind, I'm calling, they just get very muddled sometimes, yes. especially, you know, same first letter, same name. Luckily, Joey is um, also what you call a baby kangaroo. So um, I just works I, out all the way around. Yeah. So Joe's younger brother always thought it was hysterically funny that his brother's older brother's nickname was the same as a baby kangaroo. So. Yeah. Just, just good stuff. Australian trivia there. Australian <laughs> humor. <laughs> so what, how did you do your research to come up with 
like, you know, where the Australians, like, I know nothing about Australia fighting. So the Australians are very good at preserving their history. Okay. Very good. And I think it's possibly because they're a young nation, relatively young nation, like the United States. Right. Um, and they're so far removed from every, from the rest of the world that their, you know, their history is, they've made it important to them. So the Australian War Memorial mm-hmm. online resources, you know, so many primary sources there. Fantastic. So yeah. And then um, the National Library of Australia has digitized every newspaper that has ever been published in Australia since the oh, beginning wow. of time. So I have read more Australian newspapers from, you know, 1914 through 1946 than I've read United States, United States. <laughs> U.S. newspapers. Right, right. So do you enjoy the research? Oh, I love it. Yeah, I love it. And I've, you know, I've got, as a history major, of course, I learned about primary, secondary, and tertiary sources and blah, blah, blah. So I know, and you know this as well, you have to have the historical facts right. Exactly. The underpinning facts have to be right, because otherwise your sharp-eyed, eagle-eyed readers will go, "Uh, uh, 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 that didn't happen. That could have happened. Yeah. um, So when you take facts and fictionalize them you have to tell readers okay i i know this is the way it was but i'm taking you know artistic license here yeah i i in my books i try my very best and of course we can all make mistakes because of course we weren't there we didn't see it with our own eyes but i do my very best to make my my background as accurate as i can and then my fictional characters can do what they want within that that bounds yeah you know yeah. that's the world and the world is you know uh, in your case in in this story is you know world war 2 in australia so certain things cannot happen nobody can pull a cell phone out of their pocket that's going to be right. wrong you know right. and so you have to be you have to be careful i know with um, an enemy like me i had a point where i was having him get ready for a date it was 1939 and i wrote just very quickly that he was putting brill cream in his hair and then i just stopped and thought I don't know when that was invented. And so I wrote a quick note to myself, kept writing because I was in a good, good writing mm-hmm. thing and went back. And luckily it, it was around, but I realized I can't have him putting brill cream in his hair in 1939 right. if it wasn't invented it, until 41, it, you know, right. <laughs> same thing with the safety razors and, you know, right. what, all of the I'll, things, all of the things or what guns are being used or what planes are flying in the air or or even even what radio programs were being interrupted by bulletins, right? You know, yes. If you're, if you're gonna name the program, if you're gonna say something other than music was playing, right? If you're gonna name. Yeah, a I've program, got. I've got a scene in in early in um, Bravest Soldiers. It's Joe's birthday, right? And they're all yeah. gathered together for his for his after dinner, and the that's the day that uh, war was declared on that Germany, that Britain declared war on Germany. Mm-hmm. Um, and yes, I had them have the radio on because how can they hear the, you know, the, exactly. the music is interrupted. And I'm like, okay, should I go and research radio stations in Sydney? And, and I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. You I didn't could. need to. I don't need right. to do that. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because in an enemy like me, I have them listening to a radio broadcast and I actually did look it up because it, it, made for a funny thing the man my my main character jacob was yeah. listening to opera which is not something he enjoyed but he was working with the guy that he so they lived in a uh an apartment in this guy's home and he did mm-hmm. work to help pay for the rent right yeah okay and so he was he was down there with him listening to opera which he would never listen to on his own so i so, did i thought that would make a good <laughs> you know i yeah. remember that because yeah and um, I loved um, an enemy like me. I just loved oh, the, the juxtaposition of 
the young man who of German descent, because there are so many Americans who are, right? you know, um, and, and when I was reading, I thought there were a lot of parallels between our two books. I did too. I did too. You know? Yeah. So I really enjoyed that. But it also struck me that, of course, there were far more German immigrants and and middle, you know, Central European immigrants to the United States than there were at that time to Australia. Mm -hmm. So in Australia at that time, it's most, it's, you know, English, Irish, Scottish, a lot of Japanese, Mm -hmm. a lot of Chinese. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had a lot of Chinese, definitely, because of the railroads and everything. Exactly. The Exclusion Act and... We both had, both countries had internment camps for Japanese and. um, And it's interesting. Most people did not realize that in the United States, there were internment camps for Germans as well. Yes. I mean, I live in Texas and there were two big camps in Texas. Yeah. And Um, and most people that have read it said, I didn't know that existed. Yeah. And it was, it was, yes, it wasn't as, as they weren't as fully. It wasn't like the the Asian ones, because if someone looked Japanese, they were put in an internment camp, period, right. in a sense. Yeah. But yeah. you don't necessarily look German. So you had to have done something to have caught or, the attention of someone. Yeah. yeah. It, no, exactly. I, and this, exactly the same thing happened in Australia. Yeah. Exactly the same thing. The minute, yeah. the minute um, Japan bombed Darwin on the northern coast of Australia, which they bombed with more planes and more bombs than Pearl Harbor. Wow. And and actually destruction was far worse than Pearl Harbor, even considering how many ships and personnel we right. lost. Every Japanese in the country was rounded up. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and and the Japanese and Australians had been intermarrying for a hundred years. I mean, so they were you, our so allies in World so War One. Yeah, and then, exactly. and then it's like, who's who? Yeah. Exactly. You yeah. know, he can't possibly be in, you know, he's not a spy. Well, he's Japanese, so doesn't matter. He must be, yeah. So it is interesting because our books both dealt with that. You know, mm-hmm. you, did the, you did the Japanese in Australia. I did the, the Germans in America. Um, and then we both have women who are doing their, their darndest when left after war because I think right. that a lot of times those stories aren't told. We have a lot of stories about the men in war. And and sure. trust me, I, I believe we need them. It's not that I don't think we need them. But I think that we often don't think about the fact that there is a war happening back home, too. It's different. It's not with, it's not with bullets. But it's still happening. It's and still so, happening. Right. And so your Sophie is a lot like my Bonnie in terms of they go about living their life, but on the inside, they're they're crumbling. Right. Apart. They, they have to hold everything together <clears throat> at home. You know, they've got kids in, in right. I guess, you know, there's the three kids that they take in. Um, so, yeah. And I thought it was what I really loved exploring was the difference between in Dare Not Tell, it's Joe and Sophie's are at war. Right. But in The Bravest Soldiers, they're the ones that have to stay home. And they know they, what they their know boys the other are going side. through. Right, right. And they're just sitting at home. I mean, <clears throat> they're doing, oh, my God, I know how this affected me. I know how terrifying it was because Sophie, of course, in World War One, was in Paris. She was a nurse at the American Hospital in Paris. And Joe, of course, was fighting. Um, and they know and how do you, how as a parent do you deal with that? Well, I because, can't imagine. No, because you know that, that they're going to come home and when they do, they're not going to be the same. That's even right. If, even if they've not been wounded. That's right. I mean, it's, I'm more interested in the, you know, yeah. the mental effects. <clears throat> exactly. Um, and I mean, if, when you have a chance to read Dare Not Tell, you'll, you'll understand the effects that it had, the war right. had on Joe. And how he processes what happens in Bravest Soldiers. I mean, he's scared to death for his sons. Not because, not so much for, he thinks they can take care of themselves. But he knows what they're going through mentally. And he knows the kind of young men they are. Right. And, you know. Because 
because you see things and do things that you don't normally see and do. And now you have to come back into, into a world in which you're supposed to pretend those things never happened. Right. Because, and, and now you're supposed to just live happily know. ever after. Right. Yeah. Right. So many That's people impossible. really, I know so many people believe that like a war is over on the day that, that you, you know, sign whatever declarations that you sign or maybe give them six to six months to a year. And now we're all back yeah. to normal. And, and it's not true. You know, um, countries are devastated in terms of if there were any bombings and you have all of that, that's got to take years and years and years you have. And then you have all of the mental health effects of, you know, even children who um, like have been missing a parent, you know, they grow up in a different way than they would have had their parent been there. When you, when you decided to write this second book, and the focus is a, a lot on Sophie and Joe and how they're handling the fact that their kids are off to war. What made you decide to focus on that versus the the son's time at war? <clears throat> Two things. Um, one was a poem called... Um, I can't, good Lord, I can't remember the name of the poem. <laughs> but th that's where I got the name, uh, The Bravest Soldiers from. Yes, because that was in your book. I remember the reading The Women it. Folk We Left Behind. That's, okay. the, that's the name of the poem. And um, also, I, you know, I'd already written about war from the soldier's perspective okay. in Dare Not Tell. Um, so I wanted to write it from the parents, you know, the, the parents' perspective, but mostly from Sophie's. And then... At the in the course of Dare Not Tell, um, Marianne set herself up to go to Australia, mm -hmm. and it was just serendipity that she was able to go travel to Australia with Sophie and Joe. Um, so here she is, stuck in Sydney when war is declared, twelve thousand miles away from home. Right. At home is France, which is getting ready to be occupied by the Germans once more, you know, a different in a different way. But um, so I had my, you know, my young woman and my older woman. Right. And, you know, I always knew from the very beginning that what was going to happen with Marianne and how she was, you know, the the um, I always knew it was going to happen. It was just a yeah. question of how to how to how get to, her there. how to get her there. Right. 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 And I really you know, enjoyed that. Yeah. I, I love how I'll be writing sometimes and, and even like I'll find a fact or something and it's like, oh, this is going, this yes. is it. This is how, yes. this is how I'm going to make what I've known in my mind. Like I'm trying to get over here to do this, this thing and I can't quite make it happen. Oh, look. This is how it, it's going to happen. It's just so beautiful. I love to watch. I love it when, you know, when it comes together that way. You know, yes. it's it's like, you know, it's going to, you just don't really understand the how behind it. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's a lot of fun. I told you about um, my two main sources, the Australian War Memorial right. and, and the, it's the called library. Trove, the National Library of Australia. Um I found a photo of uh, parachutes being made in Sydney. And you said, aha, now I know because I That's have her it. as a seamstress. That's so did right. you already have her as a seamstress? Yes. Oh, yes. And so she it just, a... right. And, and isn't it crazy <clears throat> how those kinds of things happen? I've done the same thing. I can't think of one right off the top of my head. But where you're sitting there and it's like, oh, wow, this is perfect. Like, like it, it happened just on purpose. <laughs> you know, isn't it amazing how the universe kind of comes through for you sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I call it serendipity, but it, right. When it happens, you, it's just the best thing in the world. No, it is. And it, and it, I don't know. It's like, it recharges me. You yeah. know, and, and it often seems to happen at a point where I'm really struggling. Like I can't, I just don't know how I'm moving forward at this point. And I've got these characters and, and I'm not sure where, and I'm a pantser. So because I'm a pantser, I don't have things plotted out. 
right? And so for me, it's like, so it's really serendipity and these things come together and it's like, oh, there it is, my answer. And off I go again. So, yeah. So I am not a pantser. Yeah. (laughs) I know we had this conversation. Pantsing makes me nervous. Right, right. It makes me nervous. Um, So what I do is I have all of the historical facts you know, I make, I make a document, I go yeah. in and gather, you know, the history of World War One. you know, just bullet points, because I was a tech yeah. writer for 30 years, so right. bullet right. points and numbered steps, right? So I did the same thing for Bravish Soldiers, everything in World War One, in World War Two, and then take out everything that isn't directly related to the United States and Australia, and then go through and figure out you know, what squadron Sam needed to be in, because I didn't want him off fighting in bomber command or something like that even though australians did fly right. in europe i was like eh, everybody does that i'm not doing that yeah yeah you wanted your book to be different so you had to well, look for a different guy's gonna be in yeah so i found a squadron for him to be in and he's not you know one of the 19 year olds when the war starts that's you know raring to go um he's you know been flying for five years already as you know professionally um and um then I had to get his brother, Jean-Luc, where was he going to, you know, I had to get them, I had to figure out how they could meet up. Get together again. Yeah. 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 Um, so that took, that took a while. So I'm going through all, every Australian battalion in World War II. So and- see, what I do is, is I'll be writing along and then I'll make a decision that I need them to be together. Mm-hmm. And I make little notes next to myself. I keep writing and then I go back and I do research and I figure out, okay, what squadron does he need to be in? And how, you know, so it's not that I don't do what you do. I just do it while I'm writing instead of before. I'm not. Yeah. 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 What I'm finding interesting is working on book three because it's going to be taking the characters from the end of World War II and then. If, and taking them back to France, which is where Marianne's family is. Right, right. Taking them back to France and um, looping in the World War One stories with the with the World War Two stories, and bringing in Joe's brother because okay. he was he went missing. Okay. During World War One. Yeah. yeah. The question is, is he really? Maybe he's not dead after all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and the <laughs> thing that, the thing that, uh, that made me, <clears throat> that, that brought that to mind was seeing a picture, uh, a piece of jewelry. It's called a morning brooch, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. Okay. Yeah. And this soldier, the, the picture in this morning brooch looks exactly the way I, picture Robbie to look Joe's oh, brother and it was like wait a minute wait so that was my little minute. that was my that was my my uh my thing to set me off for book three but I also wanted to go back to France to bring the Australian characters back to France and and really talk about or broach the subject of what is home where is home yeah what does home yeah. mean because Marianne right left France thinking, I hate this place, you know, it's just flat, it's ugly, it's, it's, it's military cemeteries all over the place, all, you know, we're still digging up bombs from the, from 20 years ago, I want to go someplace where, you it's know, beautiful and it's beautiful and, and perfect, right. and yes, yeah, so she goes to, she goes, arrives in Sydney, and she's like, this is, this is it, this is it, this is my place, I mean, and I think, I've certainly had that reaction oh, yeah. to a place. For oh, me, yeah. it was for me it was Beirut, which is where I sent Jean Luc. Right, right. So, um, and and you know what? For for Marianne's father, it was the exact opposite. After the war, he stayed in France, not just because he was in you know th- wanted to do right by you know bearing. It's his mates, but he fell in love with Marianne's mother during the war. So for him, France was home, but for Marianne, Australia's home. Right. And for Sophie, she's lived all over the world. Where is home? So what is, 
what is home for her? Right. right. And what's Sam, you know, it's, there's one conversation in, in The Bravest Soldiers where Sam and, and Marianne and Jean-Luc are talking, they're at the beach and they're talking about, you know, living in different places. So, you know, and Sam says, you know, I never thought about it, but it, it would depend upon who I was with. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, that is where home is. Yes. I mean, that it is really home. is there. There can be a longing for a place, but home, you would hate to be in that place alone. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. Know? You know, that, oh, like, yeah. that would be a nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there alone. Home is really where your people are. Or at least exactly. in my place, at least for me, it is. So, but yeah, so the so the question of how, where is home is is a big one for me yeah. and for these characters. Yeah. And you know, they're I, moving all over after. Right. I tell people all the time, like home for me is here on the coast of North Carolina. This is, I have wanted to live on on the ocean. I don't actually live on the ocean, but I live like I can get there in ten minutes. That's that's pretty good for me. Um, and I've wanted to do that ever since I was like 12 years old. I knew like the ocean just calls me. This is, mm, this okay. is my place. But I often will go places and say, I could write a book here. And for me, that's not really saying that it would be home. It's just, I find it very inspirational. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine spending a period of time there, like doing maybe not the whole book, but like, you know, a good two to four weeks of just writing and just, you know, getting the book out, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I did that one time I was with my mom, we went to on a cruise and we had stopped in Montenegro and I was walking through these, these paths and there was all the shops below and all of these apartments above and the colors and there was water. And I looked at my mom and I said, well, you get back on the boat. I see an apartment for rent. I'm getting <laughs> off here. I'm going to write a book, you know. <laughs> and of course, I did not do that. But that was that was that feeling was wow. I could I could you write could. a book here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but once again, would I want to live there? Would that be ever be home? Not not alone. That that would be a you know that's that's a different different feeling. Right. When people no, read, I, I had that ahead. feeling about about Beirut. Did you? It was going to be, that was going to be where I was going to be for the rest of my life. I was wow. a junior in high school. I was going to go to the American University in Beirut. And, you know, I didn't know what came next, but that's, that's where I was going to stay. And then a war happened. Right. Right. On our doorstep and my, you know, Aramco said, no more kids in, in Lebanon. You got to go to boarding school somewhere else. And that I never that. went back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I don't so know I, that Beirut's a great place to be right now. Well, you know, it. In terms of safety. No, you're right. I have a, my son, when he was little and playing soccer, one of his teammates, um, his parents were Lebanese. And um, we kind of kept in touch off and on over the years. And, you know, they've gone back. They live there part of the time now, and it's really weird when you're on the periphery of a war zone. And I'm not talking about what's happening with Israel and right, right. Palestine right now right. because it's horrible, but it's not directly related to what's going on in, in Lebanon. Um, you just kind of get used to it in some ways. Yeah, yeah, it becomes normal. You know, we in 1975, which is when I was in Beirut, junior in high school, and the war started. Well, in it started by bombings, you know, of shops and things like that in 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 Beirut, and we would hear about it, and we would, you know, two days later we'd walk by and there'd be a bombed out shop, and we, you know, we'd see it and we'd go, okay, but it didn't affect us. Yeah, yeah, especially not as teenagers, right? Um, and you know this these these uh look you know locations here and there where there would be trouble or there'd be roadblocks or whatever um and life goes on yeah around it all and it just kind of blows my mind that that it could and that I was there during all of this and you know 
my mom came to visit to to see how I was. They lived. My parents lived in Saudi Arabia at the time, and um, to make sure that you know I was it wasn't as bad as as the adults were hearing. Um, and I remember she was staying in my dorm room, and she sat up in the middle of the night, and she goes, "What was that?" I went, "What was what?" what? She said that explosion. I said, oh, it was a bomb. And I went back to sleep. Her eyes were as big as <laughs> right. saucers. Because, I said, because she hadn't been around bombing and you right. had been around it. And it was just a thing that was happening. Right. I said, don't yeah. worry about it, mom. There's snipers on the American embassy roof. And I went back to sleep. Well, of course, there were snipers on the American embassy roof. And luckily, the school was, you know, within three blocks of the American embassy and blah, 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 blah. But she was like, no. You're leaving now, Mom. It's a, it's May. It's almost the end of the school year. Don't please don't take me out of yet another school before the and you know before the before end of the school, school year. year. Yeah, I Let went to finish. five different high schools. Yeah, and always in starting in the middle of the school year. Um, so yeah, it was, you know, and and things happen in Dare Not Te- in uh, the Bravest Soldiers, you know, with the the Japanese midget submarines, um, torpedoing. Sydney Harbor and you know a few people were killed and a boat full of 30 or so was was sunk and those people those people were died but it's a big city right for the people that that were directly affected it's a big deal but for everybody else it was like well it's not me so I'm just gonna keep going you know and and I've noticed that like um so my first book is about Ukrainian women Mm-hmm. And it came out right before the current Ukrainian crisis, like totally unrelated, crazy. My book came out and two weeks later, Russia invaded Ukraine. So like the timing was just absolutely, I, I don't even talk about serendipitous, yeah. right? Like crazy. Yeah, really? And I, I say that, you know, it isn't that Americans don't care about what's going on in Ukraine. It's that it does not affect us. Right. I get up in the morning and I can have my bagel and coffee and it doesn't change. It hasn't changed my world. I can read about it and I can say, oh, isn't that a shame? And I can even have like real empathy. Oh, isn't that a shame? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't change my day-to-day living. And so what you're saying is, is as a teenager in Beirut, it was not changing your day-to-day living. No, not at all. And so you just went about life because that's, right. and that's what we do. And, and it's true with war. It's also true with other things where, yeah, you know, you just get used to, it becomes your new normal. Yeah. And people who aren't used to it, look at you and say, well, how do you, for instance, my husband's ill and people say to me, well, how do you still write? How do you do a podcast? How do you do? You, you do, you like, yeah. how do I, I don't know. I just. I, why would I do not? Yeah. yeah. How do you do it? <laughs> it's, and it's, it's because whenever anybody sees something that's outside of their normal, they oh, yeah. assume that like, that you can't be doing what you're doing and you do, you just adjust, you know, I'm not saying that on day one that we found out that my husband had cancer and on day one, I was just back to normal, but it's been 19 months. You can't live in a state of shock for 19 months. You no. have to move on. No, you would go cr- absolutely yeah. crazy. Yeah. So you figure out what do you do with that? Right. And I and that's what happens with Sophie. You know, mm-hmm. when, when she first finds out and that her boys are going to Bonnie. war, I mean, she's like, right? But she can't live that way. No, she can't. And she she knows that having right. experienced, you know what she has experienced in the first war so she you know does she says okay i'm gonna i'm gonna do this i'm gonna volunteer here i'm gonna step up all my efforts right i'm gonna do and my then, victory gardens i'm gonna do the whole yeah, thing yeah you know right? she's in her she's 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 in her element in the swing of it yeah, yeah. she's just going along and then all of a sudden joe brings home these two little girls yep and, and rocks sophie world. being sophie yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I loved, I, I loved that. I loved the story. I loved watching her navigate all of those emotions as she's trying to, to be all that she needs to be without letting all that she's feeling 
stop overcome her. her. I mean, she's, yeah, she has this crazy feeling that she has to be superwoman and handle yeah. it all. And then, well, of so course, do most women. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And then she hits that point where she just cannot. And she's, you know, actually that the chapter that where she and, and Moira Kelly are putting the laundry on the line. Yeah. And she just is coming. She's just unraveling mentally. Right. right. I wrote that from after having been through a very similar situation just weeks before you know it just I just sat down and I let it all out out. (laughs) yeah yeah so people ask me and so I'm going to ask you how much of you are in your characters do you feel like you're a lot yeah that's what I say probably a lot but I'm in both of I'm in all of them you know yeah I'm in Joe Yeah. yeah there are parts of me in Joe there are parts of me in Sophie and there are parts of me in Marianne and yeah. Jean-Luc, um, less in Sam. Sam is more my son. I tell people that I'm usually in all of my characters. It's either as I wa- once was, as I am now, or maybe as I hoped I had been. Like yeah. I, have a, I have a character in um, Daughters, of, I mean, not Daughters, in uh, Sunflowers Beneath the Snow. And she's young and she she's not afraid and she travels and she just, she comes to the United States as an 18 year old, barely speaking English. And there's no way I would have done that. I would have been terrified. I was so rooted to my place. Like I was, a, I was afraid to like venture out beyond. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm not now. You know, now I've, I've kind of, I've gotten past a lot of my fear and I'm just, I just do what I do now. And I, she's who I wish I could have been at that age. Right. You know, like, so she's me as, as my memory would like me to have been. Yeah. (laughs) I think, I think Sophie is me in that, in that sense, you know, going off to university and then saying, okay, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to go nurse in the war. In the war. Or for yeah. the war. Yeah. Even though the United States wasn't in the war yet. Yeah. Yeah. She just decided this was her calling and off she went. Well, yeah. You know, the American hospital in Paris was, had been, the American board of of the hospital had handed it over to the French government and said, in 1914, there's going to be war. You're going to need, you're going to need facilities. We'll give you ours. We'll staff it. We'll fund it. It's for you to use. So, and then it took, you know, three years for the United States to enter the war and thousands of young men left their universities and their colleges and went over to France to fly or to fight or, um, and they weren't supposed to fight because we were neutral. Um, they drove trucks, they drove ambulances. I mean, thousands, Mm -hmm. we're talking tens of thousands of young men. Um, so yeah, she had to be one of those. Yeah. Not one of the young men, but. Right. Right. So have you ever considered writing outside of historical fiction? Not really. No, no. I think sometimes I think I should, because that's what other people are doing. Oh no, never do. So I'm going to give you, give you my biggest piece of advice is you don't have to do what other people are doing. Well, no, I know. It feels right for you. (laughs) Yeah. One of my, one of my, um, one of my favorite authors, uh, Annabelle McCormick, um, wrote a trilogy of World War I, um, novels set in Egypt and the Middle East. She's got a British nurse and, you know, there's the beginnings of the, of the OSS and oil is involved. So it's really interesting to me from my background, but she wrote these marvelous three novels. And then she started writing contemporary, you know, rom-coms and they're really good. They're cute and they're fun, but I don't want, I don't need to read that, but she's belted out. She's six or seven out in a very short space of time because you don't have to spend two years researching exactly. historical facts. That's true. That's true. And in fact, I'm sitting right here now, thinking, right now, right now, I am right. Right now, I am writing what I'm calling a com rom. It's mostly comedy with a little slight 
romantic twist on the side. Mm-hmm. So it isn't an actual romantic comedy. And it's because a, a, a character started speaking to me and I tell everyone I might be committing author suicide because everyone sees me as a historical fiction author. And I think I'm going to go back and do more historical fiction because I love that genre. But this character refused to shut up. And I said, fine, fine, we're going to, I don't know, when I was a kid, I read the book uh, by Judy Bloom. Are you there? God, it's me, Margaret. Yes. Okay. So when they started talking about doing the movie, I don't know, okay. something tripped in my mind. And I thought, I wonder whatever happened to Margaret. And immediately my mind went with, she goes by Peg and she's going through menopause. Oh, I love it. And I would read that book. That's, and that's where this is. That's what, you know, this is, this is Peg. This is Peg's story. And so, yeah, so I'm, I'm totally like, and I feel completely out of my element. Yeah. Because I don't have, I'm a pantser, but his history helps guide where the story goes. You, you can't change the historical facts and so it correct helps. it it like puts up little guardrails right yes you've you got to stay within the, these yes right right well you go outside of that and now you're just in today's world and the guardrails are pretty wide open yeah and they so are. i do feel like i'm flailing around a little I've, I've tried i'm actually using save the cat writes a novel mm-hmm. not in the way that that the author expected me to use it but more as my guardrails you know, like I'll be yep. wandering around what I call wandering in the wilderness where I'm writing. And I don't know where I'm going. And I stop and I look at and it's like, huh, according to this, I should be having an inciting incident any moment <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I pull back and I look and I think, OK, based on everything you've written. Hey, this makes sense. And then I go back to my pantsing, but it, it kind of keeps me from like doing my wandering around yeah. this thing. So, <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for what, the, what you're doing. You, you don't have that strict historical fact right. that you have to stick to. They're general, the books are generally shorter. So you've yeah. got, you know, 70,000 words versus 90 or 100,000, right. which is kind right. of typical for historical fiction. Um, cheaper to do the covers, probably, because I, there's yeah. a very strong sense of what is on covers. Exactly. These days. Exactly. Um, so, you know. Well, and, and for me, I'm also writing in first person, present tense, one point of view. Whereas all of my other books have been three points of view, past tense, right? And so I'm kind of liking it as a challenge. I don't even know if it will be a book that that goes anywhere really, and that's okay with me. I yeah. this is this is very challenging for me. It, it's really requiring me to almost hone my craft. Like like the others come a little more naturally, and this one does not. Mm-hmm. But but it's a story that won't leave my head. So I've got to get it out. And if I've got to give it out, it's not like you can do a menopause story about a woman in the 1700s. So I've got, it's got to be now. You know, it in in order to do the things that, that my character is saying. And so it's like, okay, well, then we're just going to go with it. I'm going to see what happens. It's crazy. I love it. I love it. And I would <laughs> read that. I would read okay. that. So if you ever want a reader, I will, I will read oh, it. Super, super. All right. So we know what's next is your, your third, third book in this series. Mm-hmm. Will there be a fourth or are you going to wrap it up with three? You know, I think I'll wrap it up with three. You will. And do you, do you have ideas? Do you have any ideas beyond this book you're currently writing? I do have some. Yeah. I tend to, um, like to explore the the um what the secondary characters are doing of course it, dare not tell it was sophie and joe and right the bravest soldier is sophie joe marianne sam jean-luc and jean-luc and then third book will be marianne sam marianne's parents because mm-hmm. it'll be will be back in france most likely for most of the book Joe's, I mean, sorry, Sam's parents. Um, 
well, what is what is Jean Luc doing over here in Lebanon? I'd really like to go back to Lebanon mentally, if not physically. Yeah. Um, you know, so an offshoot of that. One of the one of the site the people I follow on Instagram is a winery in Lebanon. They're called uh-huh. Set Seven. You know, they're out in the wa- they're out in the mountains. They're right. constantly finding heirloom grapes, you know, ancient vines hidden in the scrub. The exact sort of thing that one of my one of my beta readers, uh, Ray, who's in Sydney, she's my Sydney cider, one of my Sydney cider uh, readers. And her husband has been she and her husband have been involved in the wine business in Australia for decades. She said, why are you sending him to Lebanon? If he wants to, if he wants, if his passion is wine, he should go back. He's French. He should go back to France. And I went, no, no, no. Here's why. No. Here's why. He's, <laughs> he's, 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 he needs to recover from right. the jungle. He, right. he really, well, and, and really you had a hard time with that. You don't go back to France and recover because it's still a mess. Yeah. Right. You're, you're, you can't get, you can't get away from World no. War One and World War Two in France. That's no, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Um, but he needs he needs a haven. He needs he needs a place to go and hide and recover. And and and, and finding heirloom grapes would be a perfect, right? Perfect. You know everything and every. The, I do not know this for certain, although I have read that every continent has their own varietals uh-huh. that are you know native to the region so i don't know whether there are actually any grapes that are native to australia just so mm-hmm. many other plants that you know so and there's tons of places in australia he could have gone in fact i've written something that's a conversation that sam and jean-luc have um where Sam's trying to understand why he wants to go back to Lebanon. And right. um, it's, he needs to go back there. He needs to, he needs to heal. I right. don't know what's going to happen with him, but I would like to explore that. You know, does he, does he see the troubles coming down the road in that region that and go, movie, you know what? Do. I can't be here. Or does he decide that he needs to be there because he sees exactly. the troubles coming? Or... Exactly. Goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah. I love it when you start seeing possibilities and you say, mm-hmm. okay, what's going on there? Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, is there anything else you wish that I had talked with you about that we did not bring up? Oh, gosh. I don't think so. I mean, I've would. I. I I've got uh, sunflowers and your latest book, Mountain the mountain gap book on my tbr so okay super i'm and i see that you're winning awards and i'm just or i feel like we're kind of sisters in this you know we are we are and well and it's one of the it's one of the reasons why i decided that i wanted to do a podcast was as a you know i'm new i have my third book out this is the third book in three years so three years ago i was not an author yeah three, three years ago i was not an author and so to, I don't know, no one knew who I was. I didn't have a platform. I didn't know how to get my voice out there. And I'm finding more and more that there are a lot of other authors who are in that same place. Even mm-hmm. authors who have written 10, 15 books often say, I don't, I don't know how to get my voice out there. And so it's one of the reasons why I decided to do the podcast was I get to, first of all, I get to pick the brains of other authors that I feel like we're all in this, this same place, you yeah, know, and, and I can this- learn things. And then it, it gives authors a great place to like, take this now and go do things with it to help, you know, promote themselves. Yeah. So, yeah. I think the publishing world has changed so much just in the last five years yeah when i first when i first wrote that when i wrote that had the first draft of dare not tell ready and i went to my developmental editor and we went through it and i had you know the next big version of it and i started querying it i'm 
the publishing world seven years that was seven years ago i guess was so much different than it is now yeah. i thought it would be the i thought it was the end of the world when i hadn't gotten you know a full offer after 50 queries right and then at a certain point i just went you know what i could die while i'm waiting for this to happen <laughs> I'm yeah just do it yeah myself. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah but the thing is if you do it yourself you um you know you have to do everything else yourself yeah it's a it's a it's a crazy like i didn't self publish i went with a um i went with a hybrid publisher mm -hmm. which is like self publishing and having a few professionals behind you so like i don't have to do the back end on amazon and a few of those other things which is just really nice for me i've learned so much my my learning curve was so steep with so many things that it was just nice although i'm seriously considering at some point going ahead and learning those last few things and i can teach you those i can teach you the, okay. the amazon back end part yeah um, it's very handy to be able to go in and fix a typo. Yes. See, and so that's what I'm thinking is, is I think for me, I didn't want to do the, the regular publishing route because I'm a 60 year old woman. And by the time I got my first book out, I, I could have been 80. And, and it's uh, yeah. like, that, that's not what I want. I want to be doing it now. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a little bit of the, I don't know what generation I must be that it's like now, 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 but I've gotten very used to, you need information, you get it now, you want to do something, you do it now, you book it now, you get it now. And the idea that even if I found a publisher, let's say that I was one of the lucky ones, and I got a publisher right away, it would be two or three years before my book yeah. came out. I'm just like, no. No, and you would still have to do all the marketing stuff. Yes, yourself. yes. And you're still and you're still left doing so much of it on your right. own. So I ended up going with the hybrid publisher just because I felt more confident having some professionals behind me. Mm -hmm. But I've done that three times now. And I'm beginning to realize I do a lot of this almost better. I know that sounds, but I mean, like, I know me and I know what I need and I know how I'm going to do it. So the big thing would be finding those professionals for, for me to hire. Like I would have to find the right developmental developmental editor and I would have to find right. someone who could do my covers and, you know, right. those kinds of things instead of having it as a nice, neat, nice and neat package. Well, I can do your yeah. interior formatting for you. Fantastic. I've got <laughs> me an interior formatter. <laughs> Seriously. So I can do it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it for the anthology. Oh, are you? Fantastic. I am. Yeah. Fantastic. So how can people get in touch with you, Elaine? I'm at www.elainetroller.com. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook, full name. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, and my email's elaine.troller at gmail.com. So it's all easy. I haven't done haven't any tried to hide initials <laughs> or, you know, any, any cool variations or, you know, World War One rider or something like that. Yeah, no. no, just me. Just you. Well, fantastic. Just and me. I'll have all of that in the show notes. So Fabulous. Definitely, Thank you. definitely reach out to Elaine, get her book. Okay. The Bravest Soldiers is the one that, that I read and, and really loved. Oh, there it's it backwards. is. And then, um, and they're then not tell. They're of course, tell is the backwards. first one. And then yeah. When are, when are you hoping the third one comes out? I was hoping for November, but that's not going to happen. Okay. So probably, probably the following, the following okay. fall. Fantastic. It's fall 2025. Unless I can really learn to write a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I can teach you that because I, I just, it, just, it just falls right out of me. <laughs> Come teach me how to pants. Terry. All right. All right. Well, Elaine, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me, Terry. I've had a blast. Thank you for listening to Online for Authors, where I, Terry M. Brown, author of character-driven fiction and host of the podcast, introduce readers to characters they'd love to invite to lunch. Tune in next Tuesday for another podcast episode.